big dogs come out. Damn right. Okay? Damn right. So if you can't roll with the big dogs, stay on the board. <laughs> Out two tires off the bus on the way to the game. No one could handle him. And he'd be on you like your underwear. I've seen him pick tackles up and just throw them out of the way. Get his fingers in your eyes and claw you to death. And brother, he could tag. When you get a really good lick on a guy, you gotta give it. He's gonna wear your ass out. He literally should have been thrown out of every ball game he ever played in. And if he bit him or punched him in the groin or pushed their face in the mud, fine. Now, when that happens, then you must serve justice. You think you're tough? I whoop your ass! It's combat, and you have to know that you're going to be subjected to pain or to suffering. I want to prove that you could come back, and I had one of the worst knee injuries ever. Tape it up, give me two more aspirin, and let's go play. You've got to feel like you're the best son of bitches out there. I was going to be the intimidator. They weren't going to be the intimidator. I knew what was going to happen, and they knew what was going to happen. What, what happened? I'm not sure. You think about this aid him. Hey, Charlie, you better hope I never get back in you. I will kick your It's how much you want it. Not so much how tall you are or how heavy you are. Never missed a practice never missed a game. He was as tough as nails, loved the game. He could have played in the 40s, the 50s, or the 90s. He does not understand the concept of giving up and the concept of defeat. And anybody who tells me that they go out there to have fun playing football, they're a liar. This game is a war. I was not taking any prisoners, and the wounded would be shot. You can tell who the true warrior is on game day by his game face. It reveals everything, or sometimes nothing at all. I tell you, he's a stone face, that Bavero now. You know what the hell he's thinking. I'd hate to have to fight that son of a gun. Against the Giants' Mark Bavaro, the fights were one-sided. They called him Rambo, and for good reason. He played with abandon, yet with a finely tuned focus. Qualities possessed by only the toughest of tight ends. Men like Jackie Smith, who took being tackled personally. That's the way the game is played. It's a game of intimidation. I was going to be the intimidator. They weren't going to be the intimidator. I just felt like I shouldn't be tackling you. Know, I, I, there's just no way <laughs> I should be tackling. If I did, it was my fault. And when I threw that on top of really being up for a game, I went nuts sometimes, you know. One of the toughest of them all played with a barely controlled fury, a crew cut, and a short fuse. Mike Ditka, the first tight end inducted into the Hall of Fame. Ditka played every down like it was his last. Ask no quarter, give none. From the opening kickoff to the final gun, he gave everything he had until he had nothing left to give. Iron Mike had an iron will, as did the Colts' John Mackey. If I had five or six guys that were going to make the tackle, what I tried to do was to punish one, so that if I ever got in that situation again, I would run directly at the one I had punished. I always felt that you should get something out of every play. Even if it meant battering the entire Lion defense. And in doing so, he became a warrior, and more importantly, a tough guy. A player like John Hanna, I enjoyed the uh, tax side of football. I didn't like to be a guy sat back on his heels and 
let the guy come and beat me up. I like to go after them. It was, it was purely offensive. The attack side was the dominant side. Watch the stunts, watch the stunts. The side that had Gene Upshaw. <laughs> For 16 years, Upshaw uprooted, upended, and upsided the head. The upside, moving the chains. You okay, Pitt? The downside, waiting till the following Sunday to do it again. You get out there on that little old sucker, he don't know what to do. Pitts, I hit him with a forearm while ago, so he's out. He's not on his feet. Oh, yeah. John Henry Johnson was as tough a defensive back as he was a runner. He broke Les Richter's jaw and nearly ended Charlie Trippi's career. He forearmed tacklers well into his 30s, and every time he did so, he punctuated it with the phrase, how sweet it is. John Henry peaked in 1962, finishing second in the league in rushing behind Green Bay's Jim Taylor. Taylor was the only man to outrush Jim Brown in his season, and he did so one tough yard at a time. I just tried to play to my maximum ability, and I, I played very, very aggressive, and I played within the bounds of the rules of the game. And then when anybody tackled him, it was an insult. And if he bit him, or punched him in the groin, or pushed their face in the mud, fine. Every time Earl Campbell took a handoff, two questions came to mind. First, how can a man so huge be so fast? And second, does that guy in his path want to finish the season? I knew what was going to happen, and they knew what was going to happen. And they knew that if it wasn't like six of them, or four or five maybe, he's going to go because he ain't going to quit. I'm kind of girlish for one guy to tackle me. I mean, I wanted to have a bunch of them. Once in a while, one man can hit like a bunch of them. But then again, a Randy White only comes along once in a while. They called him Manster, half man, half monster, and all pro. He was never out of a play, chasing down receivers 50 yards downfield. Randy had an eternal flame that burned white hot. Double wing right, ace! Jack Lambert was the extinguisher. That'll cool your ass off. Of all the Sunday Warriors, none struck a more menacing pose than Captain Jack, Count Dracula in cleats. Lambert, he was a raging storm. An evil sorcerer who demanded that his apprentices be just as tough as he was. Jack Lambert played hard and expected his teammates to play hard as well. In a couple of games where we weren't being aggressive, he had no problem talking to me or Joe Green or the defensive line or whatever. I mean, that's the way he was, and, uh, and I think we all, we all respect him for that. Professional football is not a popularity contest. The ultimate compliment is that your opponents respect you. Joe DeLamalure, when he was playing for the Browns, said everybody on this team hates Lambert's guts, but we all wish he was on our team. To me, that's what it's all about. This is the meanest looking person I have ever seen. Ray Nitschke flew over the cuckoo's nest, then flew to the ball. I lined up under the center, and the first guy I looked at is Nitschke, and he's foaming at the mouth out there, and he's panting, moving back, and I said, this is the ugliest, meanest looking person I have ever seen. Ray Nitschke had a menacing, um, terrifying presence on the field. Just his demeanor, the way he carried himself, but most of all, the collisions he caused. It wasn't a Jekyll Hyde presence, it was just Hyde. Uh, it was just total absence of any concern or compassion for another human being. Only a state the size of Texas could hold three of the toughest characters. Sammy Ball was one of them. He was a tobacco-chewing, pigskin-slinging passer, defender, and punter who had no face mask and no fear. Ball led the Redskins to two championships, and fellow Texan Bobby Lane did the same for Detroit. 
one time we passed him the halftime coming out for the second half in Baltimore. I said, Bobby, how you doing? He breathed on me. I said, Jesus, is that from last night? He said, I had a couple of halftime. So, you know, he was a character, but a great football player, tough guy. When Lane said block, you blocked. When he said drink, you drank. And the only thing he hated more than curfew was defeat. Dallas running back Walt Garrison was the bronc that couldn't be busted, the steer that couldn't be roped, a real cowboy with a heart as big as Texas. Garrison played him with a broken collarbone, and uh, it was it was fractured all the way through. He played the whole game, and uh, I don't know if any of you all have ever had a broken collarbone, but it's very painful, especially when you get hit on it. When you think back about Walt Garrison, you think, you know, they really did chisel him out of iron or out of uh, mesquite wood or something because he's, he was tough as a nail. And Chicago's Bronco Nagurski was the hammer. Back in the 30s, he was hit by four men before crashing into a brick wall in the end zone. After the game, he said, those first four guys hit pretty hard, but that last fella, he really packed a lick. Bronco would have loved lining up beside the Vikings' Bill Brown. A shirt tail out, short sleeves in the snow throwback. Tough enough to volunteer for special teams at age 34, just so he could hit a few who used to hit him. Brown was a runner who thought he was a linebacker. Bobby Douglas was a quarterback who thought he was a rugby player. He couldn't remember half the plays, so he called his own number and dialed up some victims. He led the league in scrums, lost mouthpieces and flying helmets. And in 1972, he rushed for a record 968 yards. Douglas was a runaway train. John Riggins was the diesel. Riggo sported a mohawk and later an afro, but underneath, he was a character with character. He may have been a flake, but on Sundays, he always ate his Wheaties. There's the snap, hand to Riggins. Good hole, he's got the first down to the 40. He's gone, he's gone, he's gone! Touchdown, Washington Redskins! If they were going to remember me by anything, I would like them to think that I always came to play on Sunday. Now, I might do some goofy things during the week, but when Sunday rolls around and whistle, ref blows a whistle, you can bet that I'll be playing. And you could bet that the Chiefs' Christian Okoye would be ready, too. Touchdown, Okoye! Boy, he is too big and too fast to be playing running back in the NFL. He was the Nigerian nightmare, and he rocked many a defender into dreamland. That's what defensive end Richard Tombstone Jackson did to overmatched blockers. No one could handle him. He was just that powerful. I've seen him pick tackles up and just throw them out of the way. Just devastate people. Once he got a hold of you, once he had his hands on you, it was over. I would imagine being on a sand ball club, watching me do things that were somewhat extraordinary, would strike fear in someone. At times, I would look at films and, uh, at myself, and I would conclude the same thing. This guy is unreal. Bill Pellington's game films were X-rated. Bill Pellington was the dirtiest player that ever played in the National Football League. I couldn't even say that Bill was a good friend of mine because I was scared to death of him. And he always had this helmet that cut him right here. I don't know why he didn't get a new fitting for the helmet, but it, blood would run down, and he had this hawk nose and these steel blue eyes that sit back in his head. And uh, But he literally should have been thrown out of every ball game he ever played in, and most of the practices that we had. I mean, he didn't have any friends at either side. The Cardinals' Conrad Dobler didn't have a single friend either, but he had a bag full of dirty tricks. He would kick, he would leg whip, he would trip, but his man didn't get to the quarterback. And what happened is that this image of being the game's dirtiest player overshadowed all his accomplishments on the field as being a good football player. That was my philosophy, is take the man out of his game, and then you own him. If Dobler ever tried that on the Colts' Mike Curtis, the fight would still be raging. Curtis was called Mad Dog, and he was a pit bull of a competitor. 
Never has a man been unhappier the day of a game. And he would just get beside himself. He hated uh, the Doris Day, uh, the American flag, black and white saddle Oxfords, his own teammates. He had the disposition of a Highland moccasin. Curtis hated everyone who crossed his path. Quarterbacks, receivers, runners, and most of all, tipsy trespassers. So he comes running out on the field, great lark, picks up the ball. When I saw him pick it up, I immediately ran over there and knocked him down. Not to hurt him, but to knock him down and get the ball back, get in the game, get rid of his rear end, period. I didn't think it was a joke that I was working out there. A lot of other guys might think it's a joke to see a fan run out there. To me, it was my job. And after the game, two or three of us were angry. Bubba Smith and I went, went to Mike. He said, we said, you shouldn't have done that, Mike. You make us all look bad. He said, that guy broke a city ordinance, and I enforced it. And if he comes back out there again, I'll hit him again. Sometimes in the NFL, the scales of toughness are tipped by sheer size. Jim Parker was a mountain of a man and played like one. In the back of my mind, I would fantasize a lot. On pass blocking, I would pretend I was a mountain and that the other guy, he had to get around this mountain, and it was impossible. Sometimes I would pretend I was a freight train running over a pedestrian and just psych myself up before every play. Getting psyched up was never an issue for Big Bob Brown. His playing mood was constant, constantly foul. I didn't uh, try to finesse guys. I just tried to beat up on them for 60 minutes. As I was trying to hit that area that was just below where the shoulder pads stop, there's a lot of real meaty, nice parts in that area. We can get a little bit of spleen. Uh, usually it worked. Brown's tactics harken back to a tougher era of pro football, an era when raging monsters like Bob St. Clair thought nothing of playing with a little pain. I lost six teeth on one play. He kicked me in the teeth. And I vividly remember that because I was looking on the ground for my teeth. And, when I'm, and everyone was yelling, get in the huddle, Bob. You know, it wasn't get off the field, Bob. You know, get in the huddle. We, we, we don't want to call a timeout. St. Clair's teammate was Leo Namalini, a gentle giant who could turn nasty if properly manipulated. But when he played outstanding is when he was mad. And we would have to make up stories about the other players, what they were saying about his family, or uh, that guy did this to you, and he said this about you, and you know, and, and then Leo said, I'm gonna kill it. Namalini never missed a game in 14 years. Ernie Ladd never missed a meal. Nicknamed the Big Cat, Ladd pounced on opponents with over 300 pounds of feline fury. 300-pounder Reggie White is an ordained minister, but on the field, he seldom turns the other cheek. His size and determination have helped him become the NFL's all-time sack leader, and that's no small feat. Standing out as a tough guy in the NFL is a tall order one for which towering Ted Hendricks was ideally suited. Nicknamed the Stork, he used his enormous wingspan to fend off blockers and engulf his prey. But Hendricks wasn't the first skyscraping lineman to strike fear into opponents. The menacing presence of 6'8 Doug Atkins once caused Green Bay lineman Bob Skoronsky to issue the following warning to a young Packer rookie. He said, look, here's some things I want you to remember. Number 81 is Doug Atkins. He said, uh, don't cut him. And if he falls down, you help him up and say, nice play, Mr. Atkins. Well, I started to laugh. And Skoronsky said, kid, this is not a joke. If you cut him on his knees, the first thing he's going to do is kill you. And then he's going to kill me. But the big guys aren't always the toughest. It's really all inside. It's how much you want it. If you're scared to be out there with those big guys, you're in the wrong business. I mean, because they're, it's, a, it's a blast to be out there amongst them. And you're really to go out there and beat their ass is really what it's all about. 
if you can go down there and hit somebody hard. Whack! Whack. That makes a statement. Tiny Terror Steve Tasker punctuates his statements with every ounce of his 180 pound body. At 5'7", 165, the statement that best applies to Pat Fisher is the old adage, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. Most important is to avoid the fear. Once you win that war, that's the mental thing, that it's not going to hurt. And, and that big guy, you can win the war. It's kind of exciting to do it. If pain isn't going to be a part of it, only embarrassment is left if I fail to to make the contact and get him down. You have to be a hitter. You have to run through people. But running through people isn't strictly the domain of the defense. 180 pound James Brooks was a pint-sized powerhouse. And while he may have had to look up at his opponents, he never backed down. Comes back at the 50 to the 45, down to the 40 on the far side of the field. Plunging, 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 touchdown. Oh, James Brooks just absolutely refused to go down. Linebacker Sam Mills refused to give up, even when he was told at his first training camp that he was too short to play in the NFL. It's really all inside. It's how much you want it. Not so much how tall you are or how heavy you are. You've got to have a feeling that you're just simply not going to be stopped. The last player to play without a face mask, reckless runt Tommy McDonald wasn't intimidated by opponents, tables, or fear of injury. I actually got hit one time and uh, I separated my shoulder and I even got up with that separated shoulder and went back to the huddle and stayed in for two plays. And then I went out after the two plays because I didn't want them to know that they hurt me. With my size and everything, I know the only reason that I was able to make professional football is because I just, baby, I, I've got a heart as big as a wash tub. I don't even know the word quit. It's not in my dictionary. I wanted to give it a shot. I never had to look back and say I didn't try. Toughness is displayed in many ways, but the ultimate test is playing with pain. <laughs> Bengal tight end Pat McAnally was put to that test in 1980 when he was knocked out cold. Really, I wanted to cry, and because uh, I said, you know, I was saying to myself, how could this, uh, how could this happen to me, you know, and why, you know, why? Because, and I've never told anyone these things, but. Um, I mean, I really wanted to cry because I knew I couldn't move anything and I wasn't going to be able, be able to move ever again. And I think that's part of the reason that I was able to come back in the game is that I think I was so happy that, you know, 15 minutes later I was well, other than the pain. McAnally endured and prevailed with three second half catches and a touchdown. In 1965, Baltimore's Jimmy Orr dislocated his shoulder then left the hospital to return in the second half and catch the game winner down in Oarsville. Perhaps he was inspired by teammate Gino Marchetti. In the 1958 championship game, Marchetti broke his leg, but he refused to leave the field until victory was assured. While Marchetti demanded to remain on the sideline, Jack Youngblood insisted on staying in the game after breaking his leg in a 1979 playoff game against Dallas. I said, tape the thing up, and we'll worry about it when the game's over. Win, lose, or draw, then that's the time to worry about it. You can't worry about it now. I can still walk on it and still run. Tape it up, give me two more aspirin, and let's go play. Youngblood played heroically in the NFC Championship and in Super Bowl XIV when Chief Quarterback Steve DeBerg smashed his finger, he too stood tall. Despite a pin in his finger and a sharp pain with each snap slapping against it, DeBerg hung in and kept firing. Mm. 
Playing with a painful pinky is one thing. Playing safety with two broken hands is another. That's what the Cardinals' Larry Wilson did back in 1965. All he did was intercept two passes to win the game. There are those who insist that only the old guard would play with pain. But just a few years ago, Emmett Smith proved that rugged spirit is still alive. A lot of room at the 40, chased at the 40 and the Giants, and hauled down at the 35, and Smith is down. Emmett Smith is down at the Giants 30. Instead of using his separated shoulder as an excuse to quit, he used it to blast through the Giants. With home field for the playoffs at stake, Emmett Smith showed he had the heart of a champion. They'll never forget the day Emmett Smith ran 32 times for 170 yards and caught 10 balls for 62 and did most of it with one arm. In 1966, Cowboy quarterback Don Meredith turned in a performance for the ages. He was battered and suffered a punctured lung, yet he played on. One of his ribs broke, punctured along, and I remember coming back towards the huddle, and he's just lying down there, and I said, Don, Jesus, you know, somebody is calling somebody to come carry him off the field. And he just looked up at me and said, just get me to my feet. In a scene reminiscent of Rocky, Meredith answered the bell and led Dallas to a dramatic last-second win. No one could match Meredith's single game toughness. But three years later, in 1969, Gail Sayers faced an entire season on the brink. I wanted to prove that one could come back from a serious knee injury within a year. They say so many times, well, it takes two years, it takes three years to come back. I wanted to prove that you could come back. And as I said, I had one of the worst knee injuries ever. The Comet never shone brighter over a thousand yards and a rushing title on a knee ripped to shreds. Then there were the true Iron Men, men like Mel Hine, a two-way star for 15 years. Raider Jim Otto, playing hurt in 210 straight games. Green Bay's Jerry Kramer, 23 operations, 500 stitches, leading the way anyway. Jackie Slater, protecting 23 different quarterbacks for 20 seasons. And fellow Ram Merlin Olson, a team record 915 tackles in 15 campaigns. Dan Hampton, eight knee surgeries in a dozen dominant seasons. Jim Marshall, an NFL record 282 straight games, and the ultimate in longevity, George Blanda, a fighter in four decades. But of all those who played with pain, the trial of Rocky Blyer surpasses them all. Vietnam, 1969, Blyer is wounded by a grenade. Shrapnel rips through his right leg and foot. So I said, well, Doc, I mean, my biggest concern is that I'd like to get back and play. And he said, uh, at this time, what's your prognosis? And he said, well, all honesty, Rock, uh, seeing the damage that has been done, he said, uh, the ability to run is, is gone. I mean, you will not play professional football again. He spent months with a limp and a cane, and after two surgeries, the Steelers reluctantly released him. I was crushed. I remember leaving practice. I was driving up to the green tree where I had a, an apartment. I mean, tears were coming down my eyes. My world had just caved in. I, I didn't feel like there was no hope left. And it was something I couldn't control. But Blyer was a rock, and after one more surgery and endless rehab, he was a starter, and his moment was finally at hand. The year was 1974. The written-off 16th round draft pick had fought his way back. 
Two years later, he gained a thousand yards and lasting admiration as a man who never stopped fighting and never lost sight of his dream. I liked playing football. I liked what football gave me. At least I wanted to give it a shot. And so that if I got to the point and didn't make it, I never had to look back and say I didn't try. Ed Sprinkle was a 190-pound rattlesnake. Small guy, 205 pounds, tough guy. He hit you when you weren't looking. I'd hit anybody on any play as hard as I could hit them, and that's the way I played. In the 1940s and 50s, no defensive lineman was more feared than the Chicago Bears' Ed Sprinkle, nicknamed the Claw because of his habit of using one hand to separate a quarterback from his helmet. Sprinkle was the original monster of the midway, playing with a ferocity that would make even Dick Night Train Lane proud. Oh, he'd kill you. He'd kill you. He wouldn't tackle you necessarily fair. It wouldn't be a fair tackle. <laughs> While Night Train's bone-drawing hits rang out loud and clear, his words often did not. He came from Texas and he spoke this very strange language that nobody could quite understand. I'd catch me and body. When the Cleveland Browns, every time they come, they were just a class. They always had the stripes down there. And I said, man. I'm not even sure that he understood a lot of what he was, he was saying. Night Train had no trouble making himself understood on the playing field and neither did two of the 70s most fearsome hitters, Raider defensive backs Jack Tatum and George Atkinson. Jack Tatum's hit on Sammy White in Super Bowl XI stands as one of the hardest hits in Super Bowl and football history. In Super Bowl 30, it was Cowboys defensive back Scott Case who helped pound the Steelers into submission. But two decades earlier, it was Steel Curtain stalwart Mel Blunt who helped Pittsburgh defeat Dallas in Super Bowls 10 and 13 on their way to four Super Bowl titles. Vikings and Cardinals defensive back Dale Hackbart produced a hard-hitting solo act, but the hardest-hitting duo in the mid-70s were Bear safeties Gary Finzik and Doug Plank. No team dominated the 60s like the Green Bay Packers, and no Packer defender disrupted offenses like Herb Adderley. Who is the hardest hitting safety in the last decade? The list begins and ends with Steve Atwater. His hit on Mammoth Chiefs running back Christian Okoye is a testament to his toughness. In Denver, the roar of the crowd makes his gladiator's blood boil. For to the hitters go the spoils. Just suck it up and go get it done. The Dance of the Unconquerables is a brutal ballet. Always more war than waltz, 
and wide receiver Ernest Givens is one of those men who took the punishment but still landed on his feet. Jim Kelly has also taken his share of hits, and he learned how to keep getting up from his experiences growing up. I've always considered myself one of the toughest guys. I'm, I guess when you grow up in a family of six boys, uh, you got to be tough. I can remember many days of my three older brothers beating on me and me beating on my little brothers. And uh, if you weren't tough, uh, you weren't part of the group. Uh, you weren't a Kelly. One of the great qualities that a quarterback needs is to have the ability in the late in the game to just suck it up and go get it done. Kind of gritting your teeth and going and winning games. And Jim has continually answered the bell in some physical, physical games. Bloodied but never beaten, the Redskins' Billy Kilmer never stayed on the sidelines for long. Kilmer's courageous attitude was an inspiration for many field generals, like Philadelphia's Ron Jaworski. The man they called Jaws refused to back down when the defense smelled blood. Archie Manning never played on a winning team, yet never lost his competitive drive. A resilient rifleman who played like a gentleman, the Colts Burt Jones would shrug off your best shot and then thank you for stopping by. Joe Willie Namath was known for his fur coats, Fu Manchu, and high whites. But his Broadway boasting belied a street tough style. Despite creaky knees that caused constant pain, Namath managed to tough out a brilliant 13 year career. Joe Cap was a quarterback on the field, but a linebacker at heart. And on his expeditions upfield, it was hard to distinguish the hunter from the hunted. All right, he's down! So we're to stick it in there, Joe! But for all the players who endured the tough hits, it was up to Steve Largent to exact revenge. In the opening game of the 1988 season, the Seahawks Hall of Famer was knocked unconscious by the Broncos' Mike Harden. But later that year, when Harden intercepted a pass, Largent struck a blow for every offensive player who was mad as hell and wouldn't take it anymore. So three yards deep will run it up, takes it up to the 10, 15, out to the 20, he's on his feet. better than any touchdown catch he's ever made right there. I don't particularly think there's a person on this earth that can kick my ass. Growing up in the city and going through some of the things I had been in, uh, you know, being in jail and, and, and getting to street fights, a lot of street fights, I learned a lot of things. I don't like people I play against. I don't enjoy what they try and do to me. They're trying to take away what's mine. I'm the type of player who is more or less a Rocky Marciano type player. I don't finesse people very much. I beat on them until I can wear them down. I never thought that I was the greatest athlete in the world, and I still don't, but I consider myself very nasty. I have this anger in me. I don't really like or trust anybody or anything. And I don't particularly think there's a person on this, on this earth that can kick my ass. In the 1920s, no one could kick the posterior of farm boy Ernie Nevers. The son of Swedish immigrants, Nevers forged a running style as punishing as the Minnesota terrain on which he was raised. Rick Caceres grew up on the streets of Patterson, New Jersey. When he came to the NFL, he brought his back alley toughness with him. Nobody ever messed with Rick Caceres. He was a man's man to me. He was a tough guy that didn't wear it outside. He did everything by example, he did nothing by word. I saw the guy try to play a game with a broken ankle, and, and it, it was broken. Marion Motley had a running style molded by circumstance. As one of the first black stars, he faced a bumpy road and responded by flattening the bumps. A player's running style can also reflect the environment in which he was raised. 
as in the case of Larry Brown, who grew up dodging trouble on the mean streets of Pittsburgh. I never felt that I really had talent as a running back. There wasn't anything that would stand out like a Gail Sayers or Jim Brown. And I thought that the way I ran was the way I had to run to get home every day. There was no malingering. There was no holding back. No fear of any obstacles. Um, you know, a professional street football player. <laughs> And then, there is Greg Lloyd. Who's the one guy when you're growing up that you don't want to get in a fight with? Hey, hey, get the f out of his face. What the f wrong with you? The guy who feels like, you know, he's just a crazy man and he'll do anything. I think Greg plays out on the field like he just has nothing to lose. Don't run that f over here. What the f wrong with you? The single toughest guy that I've been around would be Greg Lloyd. He is the most intense competitor that I've been around. Lloyd's seething intensity has its origin in one shattering event from his youth. When I was two years old, um, my mom uh, left my um, six of my brothers and sisters with uh, my aunt to raise and I see the other kids with mom and dad and you know it's it's something that you you want and the other kids would be out there running around goofy no coordination whatsoever but their parents were just you know just all journey and, and I'm thinking I'm gonna knock the out of Johnny he comes across here and, you know in a sick kind of way I mean it's sick but you know it was like shut up because you wanted to hear your name called Today, as one of the NFL's most feared defenders, Lloyd routinely receives the cheers he missed so long ago. His efforts are truly heroic. In 1932, Potsy Clark told his Portsmouth Spartans they had to play every down, both ways, with no substitutions. Ignoring fatigue, the Spartans prevailed 19 to nothing and were forever known as the Iron Man team. Ernie Stockner was an Iron Man in body, but even more so in mind. Despite the mental anguish of countless losing seasons with the Steelers of the 50s, he never gave up. Green 50! For Dan Fouts, enduring pain was a test of the mind. He's just a very mentally tough person. He goes out there and he takes some hard shots and just continues to play hard and doesn't show anybody his pain. Fouts' inner strength was most evident when he broke his nose in a game against the rival Raiders. Most guys would come out of that game, maybe go in at halftime and get x-rayed and have his nose set. Dan continued and he didn't miss a snap. To imagine the headache that a person would have from a broken nose, it would almost automatically kick you out of a game, but he stayed in that game, so mental toughness has to be a great day. Few players can match the sustained intensity of Dan Marino. Bring an 89 combo blitz, correct? They're freaking right up the middle, and I gotta hold it for a square in. Throw quick pass or a quick takeoff. You understand what I'm saying? With a life alarm and fiery demeanor, Marino has captured virtually every passing record in NFL history. Intensity is Marino's forte. Intuition was that of linebacker Willie Lanier. I had an instinctive understanding of how to play the game. It was to a point that you could really play the game in your head before the game. You could play the game mentally, but all within the confines of the control of the angles, because that was the thing that would make the difference. You didn't get that. <laughs> For others, mental toughness is the ability to push it to the limit. Being tough means to me that if I ever lay down on a football field, I better be on IR or out for the year. If I ever lay on the football field, which I never have, but if I do, please, one of your crew, carry a pistol at our games and come out and just put me away. That's being tough. For Walter Payton, toughness started with training. Climbing hills in practice enabled him to carry a mountain of men during a game. In 13 seasons, Peyton missed only one game. No one worked harder than the NFL's all-time leading rusher. 
Like Peyton, Jerry Rice's toughness shows itself before he ever gets on the field. Already acknowledged as the greatest receiver ever, he still out-trains and out-hustles the rest of the pack. For him, being the best is a state of mind. Whenever the ball is up in the air, I believe the ball belongs to me. And that's the attitude that you have to have. I think if you're going to be the best receiver to ever play the game, you're going to have to uh, be able to uh, take on the pressure of uh, making the big plays. And it all begins in practice. Perhaps no player has had more practice weathering storms than Steve Young. He was bashed as a buccaneer, then lost in the shadow of Joe Montana. A lesser man would have lost his head, especially under Super Bowl pressure. Really, the whole world turned on the Super Bowl, thinking that Steve Young was going to fall on his face. He didn't. Steve Young is now number one all time with six touchdown passes. Someone take the monkey off my back, please! No, 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 no. When I think back to some of the slings and arrows that Steve had to suffer through, and we look back and see how he handled it, how he came through it, how he not only survived, but prevailed. It makes you just sit back and look at him in, you know, in awe. His efforts are truly heroic. If you've got any sense, you'll keep Butkus away from you. <laughs> Dolphin fullback Larry Zonko was as smart as he was tough. When all else fails, and it's obvious it's going to come down to a direct physical confrontation, I always thought it reflected a higher degree of intelligence to do the inflicting first. I liked that style. I won't hide that. I preferred to run inside, and it was kind of fun to meet head on. I think Larry had 12 or 13 broken noses over his career, and uh, from week, week to week, it was uh, you had to guess which side uh, of his face his nose would be lying on. I don't know why you bring my nose up. Is there something wrong with my nose? <laughs> he was hard-nosed with a nose for the end zone, and he's the only runner ever to be penalized while carrying the ball. His was a straight-ahead, lead-with-the-shoulder, blood-and-mud game that made the Zonk the tenth toughest of all time. For Ronnie Lott, football was the ultimate test of dedication and will. Some people play with heart, some people don't play with heart. You have to find a way to, to give a little bit of yourself, whether it's giving yourself up, running into somebody that's much bigger than you, or it's you know, doing something to sacrifice yourself for the team. I think the way you measure it is respect. I've always said this and I've always believed in this, that when you walk off that football field, does your opponent respect you? The key is not actually winning, it's playing up to your standard. Ten years from now, the most important thing that you'll remember is that when you see some of these people that are in your life, they will respect you for what you did on the football field. Bottom line. The courage of John Unitas was epitomized on one play in 1960. I remember in Chicago, uh, my particular man that I was blocking hit him and tore all his mouth loose. He had about 17 or 20 stitches put in it. And we was trying to stop the blood on the field from bleeding. And Alex Sandusky reached down and picked up a hand of mud. He thought you'd pack his nose full of mud. We could stop it from bleeding. But the blood just kept coming. Trainer came on the field. Eddie Block, he says, you're out of here. I said, no way. He says, you don't know what you're doing. So I read the scoreboard to him. And he's trying to patch me up with band-aids and everything. And then I said, I'll be all right. We went back in the huddle. We had eight seconds or nine seconds left on the clock. And I looked at him, and I couldn't look him in the eyes. And uh, we went back to the huddle. He called a long play to Lenny Moore, and he threw a touchdown pass to Lenny over J.C. Caroline. The crowd couldn't believe it. There were at least 3,000 spectators waiting outside Wrigley Field. And I've never, ever seen it where the crowd waited to just see what manner of man is this. And as Unitas went through the crowd, they were just there to, to revere him and to look at him. The Sunday sermon of the deacon was full of fire and brimstone. 
I wanted to put as much fear into his heart and as much pain on his back as I possibly could. You got this 260 pounds up to 4.5, and, and you got an angle on him, he should go to the hospital. And that's exactly what I tried to do. No remorse in my heart. I tried to put him in the hospital every time I tackled him. I wanted to hit when I hit and, and put my back into it, you know, boom. I mean, that's going to provide that shot that's going to put the intimidating fear of God into that running back. So each time he came over there, I tried to tear his damn head off. He invented the head slap and coined the term quarterback sack. Sacking the quarterback is just like um, like you like you devastate a city or you cream or you cream a multitude of people. I mean, it's just like like you put all the off offensive players in one bag and I just take a baseball bat and beat on the bag. With that approach to the game, I walked out totally unmarked. I have no scratches, no marks, and nothing but a bleeding heart. Jim Brown was tough. His enemies knew it, he knew it. I realized I was a marked man. It works two ways. They're gonna to try to get me, but they're also in awe of me to a certain extent. So what I would do is I would walk up and down in front of their bench or do my exercise in front of their bench and let them get a good look at me. <laughs> Without question, the most impressive player I've seen was Jim Brown. Just such a durable, fast, powerful, impressive, human being, intimidating in his presence almost. Uh, by the way, he walked back to the huddle after it. you'd swear he'd never get up, and he looked like he would never be able to carry the ball again. He was just so deliberate and so slow, and the next play he'd go for a touchdown, bouncing off five people. I played nine seasons, I never missed a game, and I never laid out on the football field. When it was time to play, I was there. And he's right there at number six in the elite top 10. The toughness of pro football's Iron Man was forged in the steel mills of Pennsylvania and hardened in the belly of a World War II bomber. His name was Chuck Bednarik, center and linebacker, the last man to play both ways. When he went both ways against us, that bothered me a great deal. If he's going both ways and I've got my guys are going one way each, somebody's got to handle him. And he was, he was dominating us. I truly believe he'd be happy if he'd be confronted that way for every week of his life, where he had the odds two to one against him. Against Ali Sherman's Giants, Frank Gifford met Chuck Bednarik. Gifford was knocked unconscious. Another notch in the belt of Concrete Charlie. A tough guy on both sides of the ball. Hardy Brown grew up an orphan. Life gave him the cold shoulder. But as a linebacker for the 49ers of the 50s, Hardy Brown gave that shoulder right back. All goes well until hard hitting Hardy Brown hurls his hefty hulk into the ball carrier. And it's a fumble with Rex Berry recovering for the 49ers. He had an educated shoulder where he'd snap it up and be able to time it so he hit hit a ball carrier or whatever right underneath his chopper. It was kind of like a Jack Dempsey punch. It didn't need but six inches. That's all it needed. And you went to sleep. Take one step forward, keep your back straight, keep your eyes open, and shoot. Over the years, I guess I've got 75 or 80 knockouts playing professional football. No, I don't feel sorry for anybody I hit. I really don't. Mean Joe Green didn't become mean. He was mean from the start. He was an extraordinarily emotional person his first few years. As a rookie, for example, he led the league in, in, in fights and getting thrown out of games. I've never seen a player as a rookie be that dominant and that aggressive and that sure of himself to, to threaten veteran players and abuse veteran players. I went from Joe who to mean Joe. If I wasn't out of control, it would resemble being out of control. It was my desire to win. At first, he pounded passers and plundered the pocket. 
Later, he swallowed up ball carriers as the game's premier run stuffer. And in the end, Joe Green was a winner, a four-time Super Bowl champion, the immovable eye beam in the steel curtain. Hey, baby, let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs and have some fun. That's what Lawrence Taylor did for 13 seasons as the undisputed toughest player of the modern era. Son, I got to do better than this. I brought something different to the table that uh, maybe hadn't been seen. Up until that point, a linebacker was just a linebacker. All he did was stop the run. He went back and defended against the pass. I made so many mistakes in the pass defense. I was supposed to be dropping on this play so I wouldn't drop or rush. And that was my answer to everything. If you don't know what you're doing, just rush the quarterback. Hell, see what happens. What happened was a reckless assault never seen before or since. He reinvented the position. He changed the game. He ripped through the meadows like a twisting tornado destroying anyone in his path until nothing remained except LT and a legacy of toughness surpassed by only one man. Go, Andy. He spit, oh, cursed, kicked, we'll bit, and punched. Stack, pow. That's what hands, Dick Butkus did in his own huddle. His enemies fared even worse. I call him a maniac, a stone maniac. I, I, I don't understand it. I don't understand why they say things like that. He was the greatest intimidator that ever played football. He had to overcome the mystique. It was almost like an odor. He exuded a kind of a presence. Roses are red and violets are blue. If you got any sense, you'll keep Butkus away from you. He was an animal, and every time he hit you, he tried to put you in the cemetery, not the hospital. The play the Bears, and I've heard it myself from different people, is that they better get ready, you know, and that's all the respect that I need. If I was an animal jerk, ass or whatever, I didn't care. Butkus thought if a helmet could be torn off, why not the head? He sent entire backfields to the hospital. Then he giggled. He bullied officials and coaches. And despite ravaged knees and playing for a perennial loser, his toughness never wavered. It's been over 20 years since this mighty bear has roared. But still, to this day, the crack of his pads can still be heard. See that guy right there? You know who that is, huh? Yeah. Dick Buckus. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dick Buckus. He was bad, man. He was nasty, boy. He was nasty. Dick Buckus, the toughest and most feared man in all of pro football.